Good evening, everyone. Madame la Directrice Générale, dear Doreen, dear Moira, Carolina, Luai, dear colleagues and friends, a warm welcome to you all at the Geneva Graduate Institute. The topic for our discussion tonight is at the heart of our mission as an academic institution. Digital technologies have influence, influenced and will continue influencing how we teach and how we conduct research. They offer a new space for dialogue and information circulation. They confront us to new issues and new governance questions. They also provide new tools that can empower us, empower youth, civil society at large, governments, businesses. Connectivity plays a key role in ensuring an equal access to information, education, job opportunities to young people in the world. Given their dual use nature, digital technologies can simultaneously contribute to youth empowerment and discrimination. Youth-led social movements benefit from digital tools to coordinate actions and raise awareness. And yet, from eco chambers to cyberbullying, the digital realm is not without risks. Digital, re digital skills and literacy and youth participation in the design of the technologies they use are crucial. Since her election as Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin launched global initiatives on school connectivity, innovation, digital transformation and youth engagement, as well as an ITU-wide youth strategy. This conference will provide a space for dialogue about digital technologies and youth engagement. Allow me now to introduce our excellent panel of tonight. And I will start with Doreen. Doreen Bogdan Martin took office as Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union on 1st January 2023. With over two decades of leadership experience in global telecommunications policy, Ms. Bogdan Martin has emphasized the need for digital transformation to achieve economic prosperity, job creation, skills development, gender equality, and socioeconomic inclusion, as well as to build circular economies reduce climate impact, and save lives. Her historic election by ITU member states in September 2022 made her the first woman ever to head the 157-year-old organization. Known for mobilizing innovative partnerships, she aims to promote meaningful connectivity, intensify cooperation to connect the unconnected, and strengthen the alignment of digital technologies with inclusive sustainable development. Doreen, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jerome, and, uh, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, it's really uh, a real pleasure and a delight to, to be here with all of you, and thank you for uh, uh, for spending at least the first part of your of your evening uh, with us with us here. Um, when we think about digital technologies, I always think it's important to to remind ourselves. And Pat, I look to you on this one. Uh, how we got to where we are today. So I thought maybe I would go back to 58 years ago today. Uh, and 58 years ago today, the Electronics Magazine published an article that was called Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. It predicted that the number of transistors would double each year, a principle that would become known as Morse Law. Gordon Morse passed away just last month, leaving behind a theory and a forecast that actually came to embody the digital revolution driven by faster, smaller, and cheaper electronics. 
Another piece looking back, uh, just, um, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the very first personal handheld portable cell phone call uh, that was made on April 3rd in 1973 by the ITU Award Laureate Martin Cooper. And of course, if you fast forward to today, we have many more mobile phones than we do people, something that was quite hard to imagine way back when. I think another important milestone, and this is something I look to uh, frequently, uh, this is some 41 years ago, back in 1982, when the ITU decided to set up the Independent Commission for Worldwide Telecommunications Development. Back at the time, there was a sense that there was this divide, uh, this fixed line, analog divide, uh, and that we needed to analyze this divide and see if this divide and that connectivity at the time had any impact on economic and social development. The commission was led by Sir Donald Maitland, who was a former UK diplomat and was the permanent representative to the United Nations. And it took him about three years to release his report which became known as the missing link. He made this compelling case that connectivity was actually the bedrock of economic and social prosperity. Uh, the commission set a goal, an important goal, that by the early part of the 21st century, nearly all of humankind should be within easy reach of a telephone. What did that mean? Easy reach of a telephone, anybody wanna guess? Pat Reinhardt, you're not allowed to guess. <laughs> that meant that a telephone had to be within one or two hours of walking distance for every person by the year 2000. Can you imagine? One or two hours walking, and this is by the year 2000. And of course, years later, when we look at how far we've come. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty incredible how digital has changed the lives of billions of people around the world. And I'm gonna say, for the most part, for the better. But of course, we know that there are a number of challenges as well. Um, but of course, today, we also have to remember that a third of humanity, 2.7 billion people, have actually never, ever connected to the internet. And many people that we count as being connected to the internet actually don't have a meaningful kind of connection. It might be too slow, they might not have the right content, it might be too costly, and many other, other reasons. Because digital has become so indispensable, and of course in particular for young people, ITU has obviously a key, a key focus on connecting the unconnected. It's one of our two strategic goals and universal uh, and sustainable digital transformation. And again, looking at the statistics and looking in particular at, at young people, which we'll be speaking about this evening, young people are the fastest adopters of digital technology and young people are also the most connected. Uh, some of our statistics show that about 75% of, of young people between the ages of 15 to 24 actually use the, the internet. Uh, and these young people are really the, the engine of what drives connectivity uh, and what is driving so much positive change in the tech field. Um, and again, just to, to mention some examples, some human examples uh, this time, I take the example of Dilanez from Turkey. Uh, who founded a youth-led collective to combat online gender-based violence. Another example, I think this is a great example, was Boniface from Malawi, who's actually working to protect his community from hazardous e-waste by helping to push effective government policies in the space, Jerome, you were mentioning, circular economy, trying to get the government to put in waste proper uh, e-waste management policies and procedures. And tonight we're gonna hear from, uh, from Luai, from, from Tunisia, if I can say your, your age. 21. 21. 
Um, so Luai actually is an intern at the ITU, and he told me on the way over, it's the hardest he's worked ever in his life, so uh, I'm glad the ITU is keeping you very busy. Um, but when you were 18, if I understand correctly, you actually built your own tech startup to help combat COVID-19 using robotics and machine learning, and so we're really excited to learn more about that this evening. Um, but we have to remember, as I mentioned, we do have this big gap of unconnected. And so I mentioned some of the great things that three young individuals are doing, but not every young person has those same opportunities as Dylan has, as Boniface, and as, as do I. In least developed countries, less than half of young people were using the internet uh, in 2022. Uh, even if uh, they are getting online faster, they're still not getting online fast enough, and more than half of them live in what we call digital darkness because they don't have access to digital technologies. Uh, and it's, of course, it's not just young people in developing countries. I think we have to remember how young people were impacted throughout the pandemic, in particular impacted in terms of their education and their learning experiences. Uh, we work very closely with UNICEF on an initiative called GIGA, which is about connecting every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. And what we learned throughout the pandemic was uh, less than half of the world's schools actually have connectivity to the internet. So we have a long way to go to get all of these schools connected and of course, 1.3 billion school-aged uh, young people did struggle, even if they did have home broadband access, they did struggle with their learning experiences throughout the pandemic because they didn't have sufficient capacities. Or um, on the other hand, their teachers were not equipped to actually offer the kind of learning that was needed online. And I think what this underscores is that Really today, there are too many missed opportunities. And we saw this in the pandemic. There were so many missed opportunities when it came to employment, when it came to education, as I just mentioned, and when it came to things like entrepreneurship. Uh, some of the estimates predicted uh, when it comes to learning losses uh, from the pandemic show that this generation of students it would be something around 17 trillion US dollars in lifetime earnings. Um, and that the, the, this loss of learnings, that is what it could cost, uh, which is a pretty big number. There are other challenges. Of course, we're, we're in the midst of a, a, a climate challenge. We're in the midst of uh, geopolitical challenges, uh, global conflicts. Uh, we're just coming out of a pandemic. And young people have to have to cope with many of the issues that my generation actually created. And I think that's why um, tackling these digital inequalities is such an important priority. And it's one of my uh, big priorities as the, um, the new ITU Secretary General. I want to make sure that everyone can share in the opportunities that come with connectivity, no matter where they live, no matter how much they earn, no matter how young or old they are, that everyone can have access to these kinds of opportunities. One of the first things that I did when I, when I took office was to launch a young professionals program in the ITU. Uh, believe it or not, uh, we're an institution that represents, I think, the fastest moving industry but we didn't have a young professionals program. Uh, and again, I, I look to, to, uh, to my friend, Pat Fachin, uh, who's in the room with us, and we were colleagues for many, many years. And Pat was instrumental in really pushing to have youth summits, to have young people, to have more girls. And I'm afraid to say, Pat, since you left us, we didn't make that much progress. Uh, but I'm determined that we will, and that's why I launched this Young Professionals Program, because we need young people uh, not just to join us in our work, and I'll um, maybe invite my colleague Reinhard to say some words about what we're doing in the space of artificial intelligence, but we, we need young people to be part 
uh, of the ITU, to be part of the ITU staff, to be part of the decision making, to make their voices heard uh, as we as an institution look to help shape the digital future. Um, I really want to make sure that we bring in young people from all demographics with different skill sets, uh, young men and young women, to help take the ITU to the next level and be an institution of excellence. Um, I think also providing these kinds of opportunities uh, was in part the motivation behind the Generation Connect initiative. I think some of you are familiar with that initiative. We launched it last year. Uh, it's more of an externally focused initiative where we have uh, hundreds of, of young envoys from around the world that join us in our ITU meetings that uh, come to different UN fora. We had a number of them with us at the recent UN conference on LDCs that was held in Qatar. We had a number of them that were with us uh, at the recent Commission on the Status of Women in New York. And so we've created this incredibly brilliant cohort of young people uh, that participate in our meetings and also participate in other events of the UN system and beyond to advocate, to advocate for the importance of, of digital connectivity and also the, uh, the important issues that are impacting young people today. Uh, I mean, we need your creativity. Uh, we need your courage to actually help push us in, in the right direction and really to help us to be able to solve some of humanity's most pressing critical challenges. Uh, we can't do it alone and, and we need you to engage with us. Um, Reinhardt, who's uh, seated uh, at the back of the room, maybe you can give a wave, Reinhardt. Um, he, um, he is our deputy director. He has a very cool t-shirt on. Uh, he's our deputy director for the standards sector. Uh, the ITU has three sectors. We have our development sector, our standards sector, and our radio communication sector. And Re Reinhard, I think I, it's fair to say he was sort of the creator, the founding father, uh, and the leader of ITU's work in the space of artificial intelligence. And he created the Artificial Intelligence for Good Summit a couple of years ago. He has displayed these postcards outside the room. I hope you pick one up. Uh, and the summit is coming back in person uh, in July. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, and the reason that I raise it this evening is because we're looking to bring young people into, into the process. And I'll let Reinhard give, uh, give some more information about that. Um, I also wanted to mention something that we're planning for September. Uh, of course, the ITU as a member of the UN system, as a specialized agency, uh, we care a lot about the SDGs, and of course I have my SDG pin on. Um, and we are quite concerned that the sustainable development goals are way off track. Uh, we are trying to respond to calls from the UN Secretary General uh, where he is trying to push member states, trying to push intergovernmental organizations to come forward and provide rescue solutions for the SDGs. Uh, and so we actually believe that uh, digital technologies and connectivity can be that rescue solution. Uh, so in September, working with a number of young people, working with our Generation Connect cohort, we will be organizing um, an SDG Digital Day in New York on the margins of the SDG Summit, where we intend to showcase digital solutions, um, digital applications to help us to achieve each and every SDG. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to that. Uh, and I think there are many opportunities and ways that you could contribute to the preparatory process for that important event. I think it's, it's fair to say that, that digital is evolving and will continue to evolve at warp speed. Um, our institutions and our policies need to keep up. Uh, I mean, I think at this time last year, we would not have imagined the impact of chat GPT. Uh, I, I bought the recent, um, I shouldn't say it's recent, I think it's 2021, 
uh, one of the Kissinger's book on AI, and I started to read it. And my husband said, "Why are you reading that? It's outdated because it, it was pre, you know, Chat GPT." And I mean, it's just incredible. Things are moving so so fast, and. Um, I don't know that we can ever keep pace with the technological developments, but I sure think that we need to try, uh, and we need to be agile, uh, we need to be multi-stakeholder, and we need to be inclusive so that we do the best that we can to put forward the right policies, the right guidelines, and advocate for the right practices to ensure that digital technologies can help the world to move forward in, in the right way. So uh, really happy, again, to, to be here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to hearing from, from all of you uh, in this conversation of uh, how we can shape a, a better, more inclusive digital future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doreen. Allow me now to introduce our three excellent additional panelists. Um, I'll start with Dr. Moira Fall. Moira has joined NORAG as executive director in April 2020. She pre previously worked as deputy director of the Public Private Partnership Center at the University of Geneva and was also and he is also a uh, visiting professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Originally from Zimbabwe, Mora brings substantial expertise in education and international cooperation, as well as in organizational development and management in the private and voluntary sectors in China, Spain, Switzerland, and the UK. She holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and a teaching qualification from the University of Oxford. Carolina, so Carolina Earl. Carolina is, re is currently a research assistant working on the EU Horizon 2020 funded Equals EU project, which seeks to tackle the gender divide, um, the gender digital divide through a grassroots and action oriented program. In her role, Carolina primarily manages, manages the coordination of the EU Equals EU Innovation Camp. Carolina is also completing a second year of master's degree in international affairs at the Institute. Luai Alani. So Luai is a second year student at Sciences Po um, undergraduate college in Monton as part of the Sciences Po Columbia University double bachelor degree. Um, Luai is a multilingual and passionate, passionate about international relations and diplomacy. He was selected to represent his country, Tunisia, at the COP27 in November 2022. And he founded the Sciences Po Policy Project, a SP3 network, Sciences Po first student-led diplomatic network, preparing future leaders for careers in foreign affairs. Maybe we can start with the first question um, to you, Moira. Um, the first question is maybe, could you present a bit uh, NORAG um, and then tell us about the main opportunities and challenges you see of digital technology in education? Thank you. It works already without switching it on. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight, um, Jérôme, and thank you so much, Doreen, for that excellent keynote. Um, so NORAG is the uh, network for uh, educational policies uh, and cooperation. And the work that we do focuses on, first of all, surfacing underrepresented expertise, particularly from the global south, and also uh, producing knowledge and building uh, strengthening capacities 
and also um, working through our, um, I'm going to forget the last one, Camille, <laughs> the um, building work with, uh, with people in the field. And in our four themes that we work on, our digitalization work comes under our innovations and disruptions um, because technology obviously is disrupting. It is very much about innovation and we are very, very keen to make sure that what it is, the way it is disrupting and the way it is innovating is in such a way to support education, to support learning, to support teachers and obviously to support learners and to support the majority of the young people who are in, uh, in those classrooms. And so really, when we're looking at this digitalization of education, in English, at least, the phrase digital education and digital learning, the digital comes before the education and it comes before the learner. And certainly, we counsel against this prioritization Education and learning are the goal. Learners are there to be supported. However, digital tools, digital tools definitely can serve to support reaching that goal, more or less, in certain ways and contexts, but not others, for certain learners and at certain ages, but not others. Now, many areas that are absolutely critical to understanding the digitalization of education remain understudied, and the evidence that does exist remains undershared, especially that from or about the global south, or indeed youth, as we are discussing today. And this is the result of deeply entrenched historic and contemporary inequalities, which are also reflected in research and investment environments. And I was very glad to hear Doreen describing the work that is being done at the ITU to make sure that those inequalities are not then perpetuated also in the ITU itself. And certainly research and policy has often failed to respond to the unevenly distributed impacts of digitalization, both globally and within nations. And the introduction of technology into education has never alone solved the problems that education or learner faces. It has added new ones and reconfigured some old ones. And that is as true with COVID as it was before. And certainly when it comes to questions around data and datification, this is something where um, certainly in education in the mainstream research that's being done, it is something that is not being dealt with as seriously as we would hope. So who owns students' data? Who has access to it? And who's actually ensuring any kind of meaningful consent for that data? If my children are at a school that chooses to implement Google Classroom or any one of these other types of platform learning, the school has given consent. As a parent, I have not. My children also have not. So where is the consent, where is the privacy, and how do we actually deal with that for learners at any age? And then, of course, what is it that the data is used for? So learning analytics, which are very, very useful indeed, However, usually only accessible by the platform, not necessarily by the educators, by the school, and not necessarily by the learners. How do we change that to make sure that that ownership and that visibility is there for those who are actually able to use it? And then the trace data that is sold onto the data economy, what Neil Selwyn calls data valence, which then further marginalizes already marginalized students and also can lead to unfair judgments on educators themselves. That market converts those data into financial assets which are traded on stock market. And then they're subject to the market rather than to the learners or the teachers. And then what are the KPIs? Is it about the technology and the implementation of the technology, or is it about education? In a research project in Brazil, our research associate Marina Avila found that learning outcomes were not one of the KPIs of the EdTech digital startup ecosystem there. 
Nidhi Singhal has also shown that in the South, there's very little education in edtech, in edtech research for disability. And all of that has profound implications for governance because the data and the data that are being produced and being analyzed actually produce a system of governance that is focused on what it is that is being measured rather than necessarily democratic participation in education decision making. Thwarting the very kind of objectives that we might have here tonight around youth empowerment and what is it that could actually be done to improve the effects for those who are already locked out of participating. Because traditionally, children and young people don't have that much of a say of what happens in their education. And so this also then leads to a policy focus on aspects of education that can be measured rather than education's immeasurable but highly valuable contribution to human and social flourishing and also to empowering young people. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Now turning to you, Carolina, can you tell us a bit more about Equals EU and as well any best practice or experience you have um, when engaging with youth around digital technology issues? Thank you so much. Is this, is this working? Is this on? Yes. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's a real honor to sit on such a panel of, of incredible people. So Equals EU is a three-year project, as Jerome mentioned, funded by the EU Horizon 2022, 2020 uh, framework. And what it seeks to do is to advance gender equity and digital inclusion with a focus on gender equitable, developing gender equitable social innovation ecosystems. And this focus is, was chosen partly because of the issues already highlighted today. The fact that as you know, we're moving forward in this rapidly evolving landscape, we need to center the people who will be impacted by the technologies which will shape tomorrow. And so that's the, the fundamental premise of the project. And, and it tries to tackle a lot of uh, inequities as well. So for example, there are about, I think, 10% of uh, women-led startups are funded globally. And so of course, the, the impacts of these discrepancies uh, are clear to see and, and they wreak huge inequities. So taking this, this landscape, this premise, what does Equals EU do? So the first stage of the project was uh, a research stage. So uh, it's a consortium project. So there are 19 key partners located in different countries. So this meant that this means rather that when we're conducting our research, we can really take localized um, ideas, different perspectives, and, and really integrate expertise and sometimes divergent opinions from across the project as well. So the first stage of the project was researching gender across Europe, in particular across these countries, and how it was conceptualized or not, how it was integrated or not in social innovation ecosystems, and then trying to build um, you know, a, a body of research that could then be operationalized when we're looking at building new social innovation ecosystems. The second part of the project was action-oriented. So again, in these 19 partner countries, we had innovation camps and hackathons, which were in particular for young women, and each tackled, again, based on the local issues uh, that that country was facing, a new uh, question or a frontier in the digital world. So for example, here in Geneva, we looked at feminism and women's leadership in an international law and policy, and we tried to really integrate women who maybe have never seen themselves as innovators, inventors, people who never thought they had a stake in the digital world. And how did we do this? Maybe to, to speak about the, this more, I don't know, practice uh, part of the, of the project, Jerome. It was actually by seeing the spectrum of uh, the online and the offline. So often to bring someone into the room, they needed to feel, as I think Moira was saying, safe. They needed to know that they, their voice would be valued, listened to. And so that meant having engaging women in particular in one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, telling them that they had a voice and making them believe uh, in our current landscape of a very exclusive tech world that they were the creators of the future. And so I think this is a really important and maybe, as you're saying, intangible piece of the work we're trying to, uh, to enact today. It's, it's the feeling uh, that we all have a stake in tomorrow and that the future is not, uh, is not inevitable. We still have uh, worlds to make, worlds to reimagine re and recreate. 
So we had this innovation camp and hackathon, and this was conducted in 19 countries. And from each of these countries, a winning team uh, was selected. And then this winning team went through a six-month incubation program. So the idea is to really create a sustainable um, process. So rather than just, you know, this one moment of excitement and, you know, we've thought about a project, it's then providing uh, the winning team with mentorship, with skills building, and so forth. And now the next stage of the project uh, will be to have each leader of these winning teams again come to a three-week capacity building summer school, one week of which will be here in Geneva. And we'll be looking here at eliminating exclusion and advancing women's digital rights. Again, really trying to build on the expertise and create a dissonant school, actually. So if, uh, if one organization is saying that this is the future, the other is saying uh, something completely opposite, how do students move forward with a critical mindset and, in that spirit, become really ethical leaders in the, of the digital future? So that's the, the project in a nutshell. And maybe I touched on some practices, but I'm sure we'll come back to that in the discussion as well. So thank you. Thank you, Carolina. I really like this, this view of the future or the futures as being a capacity, uh, a skill that we all have or an agency that we all have, and in particular youth, and that the future is definitely not there's not one future, and it's not inevitable. And we have um, uh, Professor Dupont here at the Institute who talks about decolonizing the future, because the future is already, or futures are already kind of colonized by hegemonic powers. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very welcome um, initiative. Thank you, Carolina. I'm turning now to uh, Luai. So Luai, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, this tech startup uh, initiative uh, that you launched um, a couple of years ago, two years ago, um, and also about the SP3 network. And um, we're partly interested in, in how do you engage or how do we engage with youth? How can we engage with youth? Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Um, first of all, I'm very happy um, and excited to be part of this panel of very accomplished and important people. Uh, and it, it means a lot um, for us youth, you know, to be engaged uh, on panels such as uh, this one. I think it's very important. Um, now, with, with regards to the startup that I built, um, it was during COVID uh, and I was sitting in my room. I had nothing to do. I was still in high school. Uh, I was a senior, no. Yes, I was a senior in high school and uh, I had met this friend, uh, I had met this person online who lived in Abu Dhabi. And we got together on, on Zoom and we started discussing, uh, you know, a few things we could do during our free time uh, during COVID. And we came up with this startup idea called WAND. It stands for Water, Air and Land. Uh, not very creative, but, you know, it described where we wanted our artificial intelligence to, to work or where we wanted it to operate. And so, in the beginning, we were very hesitant on, on certain things because in the UAE, uh, it, it's a more strict environment, especially for youth who want, to, um, who, who want to create startups. But now this has changed. But during that time, during COVID, um, the main issue was that there were strict fines imposed on people who left their homes during, during the lockdown. So we wanted to think of, a, so, so we started thinking about how we can, how can we help people avoid getting uh, tens of thousands of dollars in fines for stepping out of their homes, which is very economic, I might say, because I, uh, I want to have a system that tells me, hey, don't walk out, you will get fined, or at least if you walk out, it will send you an SMS and tells you to just go back inside really quickly before a policeman catches you. So. Obviously, we had the support of the authorities. We had the backing of a UAE university. So the project um, was able to, to, um, to, to, to proceed. We didn't have any obstacles with regards to regulations because we were backed by the government. And the government actually liked this idea because they didn't want to find people just like that. Um, and they wanted to have a, a specific, uh, they wanted to have a solution and we brought it to them, um, and the professors were impressed, they liked it. Um, now, where is Wind after the lockdown? Um, nowhere, because well, uh, did, didn't, uh, 
we didn't find new solutions, but perhaps, uh, God forbid, it comes back. I hope to never see Wayne again, because I feel that uh, it's much better now that we, we are back in person and we don't have to be uh, at home. Um, now, the story of, of, of SP3 is, is a big bet I played, because at that time, after finishing Wayne, I, I was applying to colleges. And when I got into Sciences Po in Columbia University, I wanted to create something before even getting there. And so I founded a, an association called uh, the Sciences Po Policy Project, SP3 for short. Uh, I started it with a few friends, with whom I, I've never met them before. Uh, we, again, got together on Zoom calls and we started discussing ways we can engage the community. Now, in these big universities, especially at Sciences Po, where the focus is political science, many students want to become diplomats, work in foreign service for their government, but 70% of them end up in the private sector. So they're studying political science because it's multidisciplinary, uh, Sciences Po is multidisciplinary, and so we decided to create a, a network, sort of like, it's a club in, in, in university. Um, and so we created this club with the intention of, of learning from the source and giving back to the source. What that means is connecting three generations of leaders, those who led, those who lead, and those who will lead the future. Now, what I noticed in, in my previous experiences is that we ha youth have a tendency to listen to the elders more, which is, which is a good thing. They have more experience and it's necessary. But at SP3, we listen to each other because there's a... There's an, it's like an overlapping generational network. It's very easy to, to it's very um, easy to, 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 to picture because you will have a former diplomat, let's say a former minister of foreign affairs, come in to meet with students, but it's not oriented so that students will only listen to that person, ask questions and, and, and get inspired, but rather for that diplomat, whether they are active or not, to take in their considerations and you know, bring them out in real life. Um, I think the moment where I, I felt the most, um, where I felt the happiest at SP3 was when we started receiving emails from governments in the Balkans, from Africa, asking us to consult them on nation building through social media. And to me that was just incredible because you had entire governments with actual budgets, with people who have studied communications, people who have studied nation building, professors who, who weren't able to understand the challenges of today. Now, of course, these people, we, we respect them so much, but um, the governments themselves coming to SP3 was such an, it sent a big, big message because it meant that uh, the government need youth because sometimes they don't know where they're headed. Uh, and so we consulted these governments, we gave them social media strategies, uh, we told them how to communicate to um, be more inclusive, uh, be more aware that uh, you know, we, we have to use certain uh, uh, types of, like a certain type of language, a certain type of English to communicate with youth. Um, and, and the results have been really good because, well, the engagement has gone up. Uh, the governments are doing much better uh, number-wise, but most importantly, youth are beginning, I wouldn't say they completely trust their government, but they're beginning to understand that when I'm running, when, when I'm running, let's say, the government's uh, Twitter account, I know that on the other side, it's not just some random person who doesn't really care about what they're tweeting about. It's an actual, uh, in most cases, youth, who take over the account and who uh, tweet uh, in our language, I would say. Um, but yeah, it's an incredible journey. It's my second mandate, so I'll be leaving at the end of this year. Uh, hopefully starting something soon at Columbia. If you're in New York, I'd be happy to meet you. But, uh, but yeah, SP3 is, is definitely uh, the project that resonated the most uh, in me, like it, it, its mission. Um, we had um, a summit in January, the Harvard Sciences Po Student Summit, 
So again, we reached out to people from Harvard on Zoom calls, and we made this entire summit come together, where we brought EU commissioners, foreign ministers, heads of state and government, at Sciences Po Paris, to just talk with the youth. No hierarchy, no protocol, just let's sit down together, see what's, what, what's going on, how we can improve things, and, and we forced them not to walk out with, with nothing in their hands, but we forced them to, 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 to take something out of it. And uh, obviously we put out a, an open letter to world leaders. Um, I hope world leaders read them. But, uh, but yeah, I, I guess that's it for, for SP3. If um, you want to follow us on social media, we are on there. I'm plugging my SP3. Thank you, Luai. Um, I'm turning to you, Doreen. Um, you, you talked a lot about um, the different initiatives um, that you put in place and that you are actually also uh, conducting and, and leading at ITU. Um, uh, maybe if you, if you have some reactions to uh, what the other panelists mentioned, um, and also how do you raise awareness about digital digital questions, digital issues among youth. Yeah, thank you. And um, I really appreciated the, uh, the, the comments of, uh, of my fellow panelists. And, uh, you know, I'd love to uh, engage further as we do have you as an intern, uh, Luai, for a, a you know, few more months, I hope, uh, to see if you have constructive thoughts and comments of how we as ITU could, could do better. Um, I mean, I think we have started a number of initiatives. As I've mentioned, we have this Generation Connect effort, um, which is, as I mentioned, more external. Um, the, the hope with Generation Connect is that young people will be able to engage with their counterparts domestically, that they can engage with their policymakers, they can engage with their regulators. Uh, we think that that's critical. This year, a couple of months ago, or a couple of weeks ago, I should say, we had the World Summit on the Information Society Forum <clears throat> here in Geneva. I think some of you participated. Uh, we tried to ensure that we also had a youth focus there so that young people are participating in the, uh, in the discussions about, uh, about our digital future. Um, but I think you know, we, can, we can do more. Uh, we, we need our policymakers and regulators to also be comfortable in engaging with young people. They're not always, I would say. And so I think that's, uh, that's a space where uh, if we put brilliant young people in front of them, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, it's there, and uh, it, can't be, it can't be denied. Um, but I do think as an institution, we can do more uh, in really trying to push towards youth empowerment through digital technologies, making sure that young people can get connected, which is not currently uh, the case uh, universally, that young people can have access to devices that are affordable, that are safe, that are trusted, that they can get the right content that they need to be able to use it in an empowering way. I think the piece on uh, education on capacity development is critical. This is something that we also saw during the pandemic that just to, to extend connectivity or to maintain connectivity was not enough. What we really needed to do was to get that basic digital literacy, to get the digital skills out to those that, that didn't have it. And that was not just in developing countries, it was also in, uh, in many developed countries, uh, in older groups like the educators uh, in some cases, and of course with, with young people. And I think by combining all of those elements, we have um, much more, many more opportunities to make it a positive experience and make it empowering. I did want to mention um, another example, and this is linked, uh, Carolina, to our Equals Partnership, and we've, we've worked together, which is focused on the digital gender gap, the access piece, the skills piece, and the leadership piece. And we have, um, I think, a great project. It's sort of a small project, but it's been quite impactful where we're working here in Geneva with the enhanced integrated framework with EIF, and we're working in Burundi, in Ethiopia, and Haiti, and it's focused on women. 
and is focused on women in agriculture or women in the textile industry. And we actually rolled out this project during the pandemic, so we couldn't actually go in country. And so the, the training was conducted virtually. And it was about connecting these women, teaching them the skills, helping them develop a website, and then actually helping them to be able to bring their products to, to market. And, uh, you know, I think, as I said, it's, it's small, but it's been extremely successful, and we're looking forward to, uh, to ramping that up in, in other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. I'm turning to you, Maura, now. Um, how do you engage policy and governance actors in protecting and empowering youth and children? Um, an absolutely critical question, because I think what we have seen, what we, what we continue to see, is that the idea of light, light touch self-regulation is not necessarily getting us to where we would like our world to be. And so I think there's an increasing recognition that more needs to happen in the governance space. And certainly when it comes to thinking about how it is that you could actually work around algorithmic bias, for example, um, where you're dealing with algorithms and systems that are reproducing and, um, and reiterating and reinforcing the biases that um, certainly a great number, uh, percentage, and a majority of young people are telling us that they would prefer that we didn't reproduce. And so if light touch self-governance may be necessary, it's certainly not um, sufficient. And so how is it that you can actually address some of these ethical issues that are related to frontier technological developments and then work out how to govern them? And it's really important to focus on the human and immediate issues as well as some of the more um, sci-fi-like aspects that um, sometimes the flights of fancy will take us into these things. We do need to consider them. We do need to be um, protecting against certain things that may happen in the future. But we have, you know, th there are certain things that are very negative that are happening right here and now. Whether that is cyberbullying, whether that is content which is not age appropriate, and I'm not only talking about the salacious content, but certainly, you know, being able to produce ways of supporting children to have some kind of critical digital literacy in ways that are age appropriate. A three-year-old needs to know some things, but they are different to what a 13-year-old would need to know and how you would actually be able to reach them. So what are the pedagogies that are needed for different ages as well as the content? What are the pedagogies that are needed that can be robust against certain um, problems that we see, whether it is another pandemic, fingers crossed, no, um, or other issues that may come up in society. What are the pedagogies that can be robustly deployed with or without technology? How is it that we can make sure that it is learner first, not technology first? How can we make sure that it's lesson first, not technology first? How do we make sure that we actually are doing what is needed from a governance perspective to be both protecting and empowering. Protection doesn't have to be paternalistic. Empowerment absolutely has to go alongside that. So you have pedagogies that are encouraging learners to read the world, and also, as Paulo Freire said at the same time, to read the world, to understand the world that they're living in, to be able to see how the power is working in these systems, whether it's through data power or the power of corporations that are controlling huge amounts of the market, or that small digital startup that is sucking all of your data and not allowing you to be able to see what information they know about you. So it's, it's being able to read that whole world, understand what it is, how it works, the good and the bad and the ugly, and then be able to think for yourselves, what is it that we would like to do in order to bring about a different future, one of the many futures that we know are down the path. Thank you, thank you, Moira. Um, I'm turning to you, Carolina. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how do you engage youth um, 
in a dialogue about digital technologies, um, current, future digital technologies, their design, their governance. In your Equals EU project, you, you have innovative approaches, very practice oriented. Um, do you want to share with us some of these insights? Um, thank you so much. Um, I think perhaps to open the question, um, and I take a leaf from what Doreen was saying, I think we can do more, <laughs> actually. So in addition to the innovation camps and the hackathons that we were able to run, um, there's still the question of who was in the rooms that we, that we created and in the spaces that we created and with what feeling uh, were they there. And so I think, um, I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, push the conversation because I think beyond the, you know, the, the scope of the project, um, I think engaging youth is a, is a complex question because I think, as we've mentioned, youth are engaged. And I think the question then is how to listen somehow and how to uh, create these sustainable pipelines so the, the thoughts they're having, the, the, the new futures that they are creating and the worlds they'd like to see are being enacted somehow. Um, and, you know, the intergenerational dialogues that we're having, how can we learn but also, um, you know, create new, new ways of, of dialoguing and actually enacting what youth are saying. And I think the, the plus point that I think we've learned from Equals EU is the, the importance of uh, participatory learning, of creating, of, uh, of workshopping new tools, new, new governance systems, new policies, and really trying to center um, the most marginalized. I think that's the, the kind of the fundamental thread and the only way that we can really create a future um, that will avoid some of the dangers that we have seen enacted and that uh, I think a lot of us have an anxiety uh, for when we're looking ahead. You know, when we think about ChatGPT, we, whoever uses ChatGPT, we have a, a very polished computer system which acts almost in a humane fashion. But do we think about the, the gig economy and the Kenyan workers who are actually, you know, being mentally scarred in their own words, um, by removing the profanities, the sexualized content, the salacious content in a, in a country far away from where most of these users are. So how do we expand and, and really think about who is not at the table with us? Uh, this is a question that I think will always bring us to a, a higher point, uh, a more important point, and, and one which will really create the future we're hoping to see. And, and I think a lot of youth uh, from the Equals EU project, from the conversations I've been lucky to have, have a deep, innate sense of what they need, what scares them, what they hope for. And so I think what we need now is to really you know, embed uh, a culture where in our international organizations here in Geneva, a decision is illegitimate without someone, uh, a youth at the table. This is why it's so fantastic to hear um, you know, uh, Doreen saying that, you know, there's a new program at the ITU for this work. And I think if we, if we really want to, you know, revolutionize and radicalize tomorrow, and we don't have so long anymore, this, you know, this energy really needs to be there, I think, at every level. Um, so I think youth are engaged. I think it's the short answer. I think it's how can we listen to this engaged youth better? Uh, and in more dynamic ways and in ways that are actionable. Where can, how can we put the money, the funding, the trust in that engaged youth and also from our elders, and there's a lot to learn, um, who have you know, the, the historical knowledge of the negotiation <laughs> you know, and how that happens in Geneva, the things that are slightly obscure perhaps. How can we you know, create this culture of passing down uh, that torch and that flag to the next person. So I apologize, this is very nebulous perhaps, but I think you know, this, uh, this continuous questioning, dialogue, capacity, upskilling, uh, but remembering that uh, we, we know somehow, we all know uh, what we feel deeply, and I think bringing this emotional connection to the world we want to see is a very important one that somehow has been marginalized too often, I think, in our discussions, uh, is my, perhaps my, not the equal EU two, two cents, but <laughs> here we go. Thank you, thank you, Carolina. Um, I, I, I want to come back to you, uh, Luai, but first, I see, uh, I saw you, Doreen, uh, like nodding a lot. Do you want, do you want to respond? No, th uh, thank you. I mean, I couldn't agree with you, with you more, Carolina, uh, especially on the need to have more intergenerational dialogues. I think that's that's really critical. We've started to do that, um, and we will continue to do more. 
Um, and of course, your point about listening, I think, is another big one. Uh, sometimes we talk too much and we don't listen enough. So I think that's um, that's a really, really good uh, point. And then, you, of course, you mentioned ChatGPT. And I was going to say, can we get a like, show of hands? Maybe not who uses it, because maybe your professors are in the room and you don't want to admit it. But so let, could we like a show of hands or who has used ChatGPT? OK, yeah. So the large majority. Um, because it, it would, you know, when it comes to just ChatGPT, for example, all of the issues that have arisen uh, since, uh, I guess it was December last year, um, I mean, we, we, we don't know the answers. And if we don't have, uh, let's say, multi-stakeholder intergenerational issues, we have no idea what has to be tackled. Should it be banned in schools? Should it be used in schools? I mean, there's so many issues that need to be tackled on so many different levels. So again, that, that point on the need to listen, uh, we will listen, and also the intergenerational piece. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Luai, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, actually a few about ChatGPT. Um, just so you know my position, I think it's awesome. Um, and it's actually incredible. It saved me a lot of time. I don't use it on a daily basis, but you know, I use it when I need to. Um, uh, Sciences Po, my school, was actually the first institution in the world to ban ChatGPT. So if you're caught using it, you fail your year. Uh, and so uh, it created a lot of uh, désistement, a lot of uh, uh, pushback uh, from f from the students. So I guess uh, Sciences Po students are less likely using ChatGPT. Although, bon. mais uh, I, I think um, uh, I think creating spaces for inclusion is also very important. Um, ITU is doing it through Generation Connect, you know, amplifying youth voices, uh, but also creating this, this, this idea that leaders and youth are equal at the, at the non-official negotiation table, let's say. When we're out there negotiating for uh, our work, our education, our civic engagement with leaders, we want to be equal to them uh, at the negotiation table. I think that's very important. Um, I also, I, I think this is a, like, my final point is, I would say, subjective in the sense that so I think trust is also an important, uh, an important factor to consider. It's subjective, but um, it should be mentioned. And what I mean by trust is, you know, youth have been used um, in the past politically, but this has changed with technology. We've seen how youth have been used in, in politics, but this changes with the fact that we are our own, we, 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 we control the social, uh, we, we control the internet essentially. Because we are connected to it, uh, we, are, we, we dominate it by, in numbers. And so I feel that, you know, youth are valid, uh, or like I, I wouldn't say uh, youth, all of youth, but uh, the representatives of youth are valid uh, counterparts at negotiation tables. Mm -hmm. And they're not just students, they're, they're here to, to, to uh, list what they want. And obviously governments and international organizations can make reservations. But you know, it's important just to hear us and, 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 to, uh, and, and to include us in, in your high level meetings as well. So we can see what's happening around the world. I know the, the, um, there's a UN tech envoy, right? uh, UN youth envoy, which is a big step forward. Um, at COP27, there was a children's and youth pavilion, which is a first ever. Um, with regards to tech, I think we're also moving positively in the right direction. But we should build on this momentum and, and, and not go back. Um, just one final point. I think there's an important distinction we should make. Um, that the vast majority of youth connected to the internet today are youth in, in cities. Um, but we should definitely do more for youth who are in rural areas. Um, and like Doreen mentioned, connecting the unconnected, the, the, the 2.7 billion uh, who, who've never used internet before. Um, and this is what we have to 
provide youth with, with not sell them the idea, but tell them that, look, there's an entire other world that exists that is not on Earth, and you can learn a lot from it, and you don't have to do any effort to go and, and get that information or get that specific thing. So I guess you know, creating spaces for inclusion, listening to youth, um, and making them part of the conversation, but also part of the decision-making process. Um, and I'm eager to see where we go from here, especially because uh, there's a lot of mental pressure uh, and a lot of pressure to maintain this mental balance. Um, you know, we're approaching 2050 and the world's going to look completely different, but I'm excited for it. Uh, and you shouldn't use ChatGPT in your assignments. Thank you. Thank you, Luai. So we, at the Institute, we have a specific uh, uh, directive uh, for um, uh, ChatGPT. So we don't ban it, we don't forbid it, um, but we ask students to actually reflect on how they use it and to declare it. So it's a very, it's a different approach. Uh, I want to turn to you. Maybe uh, we have some questions um, either online uh, or here in the room. Oh yeah, of course. And um, uh, Reinhardt, do you wanted to? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, and thank you for the organizers for putting this panel together. It's been wonderful to see something more from a grassroots level and more on the high level policy making level. Um, I'm actually a, a graduate student at, at the institute. I graduated last year along with Carolina. Um, so it's been wonderful to see you on, on the panel as well. Um, my question would be in terms of digital economy. I know that, for example, a lot of international organizations working on the specific issues. So where is ITU looking to position itself? Um, the second question is, I guess youth are changing the way we, we look at the digital economy. It's, we're changing the economic structure itself. So a lot of it are, if you think about it, decentralized finance, the digital economies, looking towards more the direction of decentralizing, um, more open governance. And maybe in terms of, of Geneva-based international organizations, a lot of them are multilateral governance body. Will that go against this, this founding principles of governing something from a multilateral level? Um, how do you look into the future of governing something that is supposed to be for open governance and decentralized? Um, I guess my third question, maybe if you have the time, is to look at, um, I guess, this conversation on multilateralism versus plurilateralism. Um, is there a future for youth to participate in this transition or whatever is that is going in the direction it's going towards? Um, if we are going to redefine the our understanding and our structure of the of the multilateral international governance. Thank you. Okay, maybe before we jump to um, Reinhardt's exciting intervention, just a, a couple of uh, quick comments, and I'm sure my, my other panelists would also like to jump in because those are important questions um, that um, um, we may not have all the answers for at this, uh, at this point in time. Um, ITU has a role in the digital economy, as you can, as you can imagine. ITU is the agency that actually collects all the ICT data from the member states. So when it comes to you know, the number of internet users or mobile phone uh, subscriptions, uh, ITU is, is the one that collects that, uh, that information. We work closely with UNCTAD uh, here in, uh, in Geneva. We work closely with the OECD, UNDESA in New York, and um, 
and together we, uh, of course, share uh, different data sets and statistics to be able to assess the state of the digital economy and look at different interventions that our institutions may be able to bring to different discussions. Um, I think maybe on the point of um, open governance versus the whole multilateral system, it's important to follow what's happening in the run-up to um, the Summit of the Futures next year that's planned in September in New York. Uh, we're in the midst of discussions on the Global Digital Compact. Uh, the ITU is actively um, engaged in that process as the, um, the Global Digital Compact is intended to lay out uh, a number of principles, um, at least at the moment, I think they're called principles, principles that will help direct and shape and guide our digital future. Uh, and of course, some of those principles come to some of the points you were mentioning about, about data, data governance, about internet governance, about digital inclusion, and of course, um, things linked to, uh, to artificial intelligence, human rights in the space of digital, and, and much more. So I think that's an important process. Uh, we hope that it delivers a successful outcome. And I do think that Geneva, International Geneva, has an important role to play in that process. But I also think in terms of, uh, of digital issues in general, that the Geneva community and the Geneva institutions uh, and partners like the Graduate Institute uh, are well placed to connect the dots and actually help advance uh, further interventions to bridge the digital divide and, and help shape that digital future. Um, so I think in terms of what I've seen, there's a much more serious desire to engage meaningfully with youth and to listen in very real ways. I think a few years ago, if you went to a summit or an international meeting, you know, you would almost see somebody handing the youth representative the speech before they gave it. Mm -hmm. I think that is happening much less. I think that there is, there are also newer and, and, and more frequent attempts to engage. So there was the Transforming Education Summit in September last year. And that was the outcome of months of consultation. I'm just checking the numbers. It was half a million youth in 170 countries who participated in that. So making sure that the outcome document on the day is heavily consulted upon before it gets to that point, and making sure that the, um, the process is more meaningful than potentially the window dressing might have been seen as being in the past, which I think is very important. And then briefly on chat GPT, since I put my hand up, I felt it was only responsible to experiment, both as a teacher and also as someone who has to read and publish and edit an awful lot of writing. It was only responsible for me to experiment, see what the products were, see how flat the writing comes out. Forgive me, it's dull. Carolina, Luai, do you have any comments to make? Maybe just a brief point that I think um, in terms of will youth be meaningfully engaged, I, I go back to the same point somehow of, uh, of safety and creating that, uh, that space, you know, in, talk, in seeing um, who can be a digital entrepreneur, for example, we know that there are gendered um, differences, disparities and disproportionate um, your know, ability to be online and to, to take space in this way. So I think, as you're saying, consulting and, and opening up um, who, can, uh, who can partake in these discussions will be important and somehow determine the answers to, to your questions very briefly. No, I think it's very interesting. Um, I, I won't be able to add much to what has been said already, but um, as I've previously said, I think you know, we're moving on, this, on, on a really positive trajectory towards including youth, even in, this, in the decision-making process. Um, there are, I don't know if you've seen this, but there are hundreds of G20 youth representatives this year, which is incredible, the, the Y20, 
which was really, really cool. So you'd have uh, hundreds of students from different schools, from different uh, institutions from around the world representing their countries. Um, and I think more should be done uh, in the sense that we should let more uh, youth join country delegations in important international meetings. Uh, I was thrown in, in, in the sea and asked to swim as, as a tech negotiator for my country. I was surrounded by diplomats, by, uh, by tech experts, and I feel that that sort of you know, on-the-ground experience is essential, it's necessary, um, and uh, I hope to see it in other sectors too, not only in diplomacy and foreign affairs or in politics, but uh, in, in agriculture or in, in, in finance or in consulting or uh, wherever it is, uh, I feel that uh, you know, we're, we're doing more and it should be recognized, but there's a long way ahead and why not do more? Uh, I hope that uh, answers a bit of your, of your three questions. Thank you, Nuai. Uh, Reinhardt? Yeah. My name is Reinhardt. I'm a colleague of Doreen. I would like to invite you to come to our AI for Good Global Summit, <laughs> which will take place on the 6th and 7th of July at the uh, Geneva International Conference Center, just a few hundred meters from here. We feature not only speakers, which are really hard to get, but we also have over 40 robots, and among them, nine humanoid robots. There is no other event in the world that we know of who has been able to uh, put this together, and the mastermind behind our robotics program is my colleague, Guillaume Martinez. He has been studying here at the Graduate Institute for a master's in international law, so we're looking for additional people like Gilem, and if you would like to work as an intern for us at ITU, or would like to help us out at the summit, we need very many hands, and you get a t-shirt like what I'm wearing here. I th so, come, come to see us afterwards, yeah. I think that the impact of AI on humankind will be much bigger than the impact of climate change. Eventually, there will be nothing that computers will not be able to do better than a human being. No one knows when this will be. Will it be in 10 years, in 50 years, or in 100 years? But I think things are moving much faster than, than many people thought. I think that chat GBT is unbelievable. So I'm not of the opinion <laughs> of your mm -hmm. panelist, Moria. I think this is as big an event as the invention of the smartphone or uh, the invention of the computer of in, or integrated circuits or maybe the printing press. I think this will just change the world dramatically. And uh, it is important that we all understand the good sides and the bad sides or impact that AI will have. And uh, that should be maybe the biggest reason for you to come to the AI for Good uh, Global Summit so that you are able to discuss this with, uh, with experts or non-experts in the field. So please come and, uh, and join us. Thank you. Just to continue that conversation, I agree with you that ChatGPT is deeply, deeply significant. I merely think its writing product is flat. And I think it is also deeply problematic that a colleague of mine who was also experimenting put her name in, and it's a very, very distinctive name, and it made stuff up. Mm. And so it's not about, I'm, I absolutely agree that it is deeply significant. I absolutely agree that it will change things enormously. I'm not sure about being able to do everything. I think there's caring professions that, you know, it'll take a lot longer if it's ever going to be able to do that. Human interaction, I think there's a huge amount that still needs to be said about human interaction, human feeling, as you were saying, Carolina. I don't think, I think it's a crystal ball that we're all gazing into, we don't know. Um, but I do think that it's absolutely critical that we take inspiration from youth and student organizing in the past and the present that we're going to see it being used for positive change and also that the question 
sure the question is about tech, but it's also about how we will organize ourselves around it and how we will organize our governance systems around it and how we will make sure that those governance systems are listening to very engaged young people and the views that they have and how they would like to construct their futures too. Thank you, Moira. I'm afraid we're reaching the end of, uh, of our event. Uh, maybe, Doreen, would you like to share with us a couple of final thoughts? Um, well, I mean, maybe just to, to, to thank you again. Uh, really, um, it, it, it's great to be here and uh, really an honor to be uh, amongst such distinguished panelists. I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, some some good uh, takeaways for me personally and as Secretary General of the ITU and hope that we can count on you to hold us accountable as we continue to strengthen our youth programs, as we become better listeners, as we engage intergenerationally, uh, and as we continue to experiment uh, with, uh, with new technologies, uh, be it chat GPT or other. Uh, you know, I think we... We have uh, a lot of exciting things on the horizon in terms of our, our digital space, and we do want to make sure that, that it's safe, it's inclusive, and it's empowering. So thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> Maybe for our uh, other panelists, do, do you want to, Karina, Luai, Moira, do you want to also share final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts for me on AI would be to get on AI right now, start following it if you're not already. Uh, another thing, we're going to be the first space-faring civilization. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to look at. Um, and not only to look at the big players, such as the US and China, but to include other countries as well, who have incredible talents, such as Tunisia. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really ex excited to see um, uh, AI in, in, in a couple of years, but also what we will accomplish after landing on Mars uh, and uh, going back to the moon, which I think are very incredible and amazing topics. So if you want to have a conversation on that, I'm very happy to, to talk about that. And um, for finding final remarks, maybe not to be dark, <laughs> but I would like to maybe say somehow what will not change with the advent of the, of the technologies, rather, that we're talking about today. So the, the generational systems of oppression that we have created over many hundreds of years, the, the exclusionary practices that are embedded in our cultures and societies in different ways, but are present everywhere. I think there's a, uh, there's a potential to see in the, in the glitter and the shine of this new tech, um, that it is, it is godlike, it is perfect, but what is not changing somehow? And how can we remember that everything that is, to, is tomorrow's world is also by design? You know, somehow, you know, one day maybe it will be by AI's design, but for now, how can we, in this moment that we have at this precipice, make sure that that design might change some of the, the very big ills that we've seen for, for many millennia somehow? Um, so that's maybe a question I, I, I would like to close with. Sorry to be a bit darker than uh, my counterpart here. I couldn't say anything after that. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>